Hi, good evening. I'm Ruth Mandel, director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics here at Rutgers University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's special event. This is just one of many exciting events that we've planned for this fall, and I'd encourage all of you, I know many of you are students in the class, but there are other people here, um, to pick up the flyer outside the room with details about other upcoming programs. In particular, I want to mention uh, that on Monday, October 15th, we'll be presenting NBC political director Chuck Todd at the Douglas <coughs> Campus Center, and there's still time to sign up for that event and, of course, for the others. So don't, for don't forget to grab a flyer and visit our website. Some of you may not realize that you're actually attending a session of a course. The course is called Political Campaigning. Uh, that has been taught at the Eagleton Institute of Politics for more than two decades. And it's always been taught by a bipartisan team of political practitioners in collaboration with a scholar, with a political scientist. The course is a perfect example for us of what the Institute itself is aimed at. We aim for more than a half a century now at enriching the study of politics by linking it to the world of, the politi of political practice, connecting students with people whose everyday lives and work revolve around politics, government, and policy making. And what a year it is for politics. I don't think I need to tell you that. Uh, in this intense and combative election year, there's the usual interest in the candidates and in important issues facing the country. But now, an additional focus on the political process as it unfolds in a world of unprecedented technology and unprecedented amounts of money especially in the wake of the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision, election year 2012 is a wash in money, nearly drowning in what the late California political leader, Jesse Unruh, who many, many years ago actually used to teach at the Eagleton Institute, and he described it as money, as the mother's milk of politics. Sometimes we might need to change the diet a little bit. The political campaigning course that you've joined for tonight is remarkable in several ways. Uh, it's received the highest possible scores for student satisfaction, making it one of the top rated courses here in New Brunswick. The credit for that ranking goes to the instructors, Maggie Moran, seated at the right of the <laughs> set of chairs and Mike Duhame seated at the other end. They work with assistant research professor Dave Anderson. Maggie is a Douglas College alumna, a regular at Eagleton both before and since her graduation. She's a widely admired and sought after democratic strategist. Mike is also a Rutgers graduate and alumnus who, as a matter of fact, took this very political campaigning course himself as an undergraduate. He describes himself as not an outstanding student, but I'll leave it for you to judge where he's gone from there. Uh, today, Mike is a nationally prominent and highly respected Republican strategist. Mike and Maggie took over the course from its previous longtime instructors in 2009, and since then have distinguished themselves with their extraordinary knowledge, their wit, and civility, especially notable because of their stances at opposite ends of the partisan spectrum. When we decided to offer a public program highlighting the influence of money in the 2012 elections, we turned to Mike and Maggie knowing they would keep the discussion both informative and lively, but with a minimum of bloodshed. Tonight, they're joined by two experts who are working at the epicenter of political money. One of them, Jonathan Caligio, has Rutgers credentials like Mike and Maggie, uh, having graduated in 2001 from our Eagleton Fellowship Program. The other, Jeffrey Pollack, hasn't advised us of any Rutgers ties, uh, but we won't hold that against him. I understand he does have some New Jersey ties. 
I look forward to an enlightening conversation about an extremely important topic, and I'm delighted to turn the program over to Mike Duhame and Maggie Moran. Thank you. Good evening, Rutgers, and good evening to all the Eagleton supporters out there, and of course to our students uh, for coming over tonight in what was some pretty intense weather. Um, I want to just make one mention about my friend Mike. He has great judgment, and you're probably surprised to hear me say that about a Republican, but he actually married a Democrat. So <laughs> it's clear to me that on the most important values he's had to make in life, he's always made the right choice, right? <laughs> um, I wanted to introduce to you uh, the guest that I invited here tonight, Jeffrey Pollack. Uh, Jeff is sought out by governors, U.S. senators, presidents alike, by political parties, uh, independent expenditures. Uh, he's sought out by corporations and has a is the founder of Global Strategy Group, which is a just tremendous public affairs firm located in the city but with offices all over. Uh, and he is just a tremendous professional who has done a remarkable job in this business of making sure that messages are compelling and break through the clutter. Uh, and I want to thank Jeff for coming. One other plug for Jeff so you know, uh, is, and I think this is a really important professional development, Jeff. Uh, Jeff's going to be in a movie uh, next year, uh, and I'm plugging it so you guys all make sure you go out and watch it, with Bradley Cooper and Ryan Gosling and Eva Mendez, which I'm sure was the most exciting part for him about the movie. It's called The Place Beyond the Pines. So as Jeff develops this new celebrity aspect of his uh, incredible resume, uh, I just wanted to give a warm welcome to Jeff Pollack, and thank you for coming down here tonight. Thank you. We're right on the ground floor of your movie career. Indeed, this yeah. is the end of your political career, the beginning of your movie career. This One, is this a man great. Can dream. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for coming, and thanks especially the students for uh, hoofing it over to uh, to Bush. Uh, one uh, one note. Our class is usually off the record. Tonight it is clearly on the record. Um, so this is a little bit different for our class. So yeah. Maggie and I are going to try to behave ourselves as best we can and hope everybody will as well. Jonathan Collegio is here uh, on, the, on the Republican side uh, of the spectrum tonight. Jonathan is one of the foremost uh, communications professionals both in uh, the world of politics and, uh, and beyond. Right now he is the Director of Communications for American Crossroads, which is the, uh, the largest outside group right now playing in the, uh, in the political world. He also uh, was the Director of Television for uh, Digital Television for the National Association of Broadcasters. He and I worked in the same building back in uh, the mid part of the last decade where he was uh, press secretary of the NRCC, also deputy chief of staff to Congressman Patrick McHenry on the Hill. So has a lot of experience both on the governmental side as well as the political side and the communication side and uh, brings a wealth of experience both in this election cycle and many election cycles in the past. So thank Very you for coming. Thank you for having me. For sure. So I'll just try to set the stage a little bit for the discussion tonight. We want to have a lot of Q&A tonight. We're going to ask each of our speakers to talk a little bit about the projects they're working on this year, which is, I think, a, a great case study. As we always try to do in this class, we try to use the current election uh, that's going on as the case study for this class. But uh, the overview tonight, really, it is about money in politics. And this has been a very uh, different year for money in politics with, uh, as Ruth talked about, Citizens United has uh, opened the door for a lot more uh, outside money coming into the political spectrum. And what we want to talk about tonight is, is what does that mean, both kind of in an academic sense in terms of uh, how does campaign finance reform kind of affect candidates and campaigns and outsides group, but also very specifically, how is it affecting this election? Obviously, we're going to talk about the presidential election, but there's an awful a lot down ballot as well. But it's important to note uh, this is not entirely new. While it is different this year, certainly, it is not brand new. This is not the first time there's been outside money. It wasn't like in 2010 and 2008 or even 2004. It was only the presidential campaigns and candidates doing. There have always been outside groups. I shouldn't say always, but certainly in our recent history, there have been outside groups, 527 organizations, which are groups that are outside the campaign structure, outside the campaign finance limits of the candidates, but can advocate uh, for the election or defeat of candidates as long as they follow certain rules and do not coordinate with the campaigns. Uh, the different party committees have independent expenditure units, both the, the RNC, the DNC, the congressional committees, and the Senate committees on each side can have their own independent expenditures, as well as groups that are outside and completely unattached to the candidates whatsoever. And now with Citizens United, you have super PACs, which are PACs uh, dedicated expressly to help uh, one candidate. And that can happen at the presidential level. It can also happen at the congressional level, U.S. Senate level, uh, you name it. And people are wondering how that's going to move going forward. This is really the first year where they have been tremendously involved. In my opinion, it had a, a, dr a dramatic effect on what happened in the Republican primary in terms of extending it, um, in terms of what it benefited. But that was the first time that happened. So a lot of people are watching what these gentlemen are doing and trying to figure it out because there is no playbook for what's going on right now. This is the first time there's been that much. Uh, and in my 
my opinion, that much change going on from this side of things. So that's kind of an overview of where we're going to go. We're going to talk a lot about campaign finance reform and issues. We want to hear everybody's opinions and questions as well. But I think we'll, we'll set the stage a little bit by letting each gentleman talk about kind of the projects they're working on this year, and then we can go into discussion. So, right. Jeff, we wanted to start with you, and we wanted to understand, I mean, uh, act as if there, this entire room has no familiarity with these kinds of vehicles, and mm -hmm. give us a sense of the pro-Obama PAC, Priorities USA, of which you're both a strategist and a media practitioner. Um, and, and tell us, A, how it functions, how do these come together, how do they get funded? B, what's the mission of Priorities USA? Uh, and C, if you could, give us a sense of sort of the message strategy and planning that goes on um, that, and what kind of value it adds or does not add to the political spectrum, and maybe an example of an ad. Sure. Uh, thank you again for, for having me. Thanks for, for having me here in, uh, in New Jersey. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk. I, I wish I could say it's a pleasure to talk about the role of super PACs in elections. It's not. <laughs> um, uh, the Supreme Court made a strange decision that has allowed these entities to exist, uh, and unfortunately that has led to this escalation in these super PACs, these PACs that are supporting one candidate. And, and as Mike said, it's not just in the presidential. Let me be clear. In random congressional race, you have super PACs where one or two donors are getting together and putting a million dollars or two million dollars into a super PAC organization in order to try to influence the election. Um, and that's never happened before uh, in, in that kind of way. That's the sort of historic point. Um, and for, as, as uh, many of you may know, um, President Obama, of course, had a very strong opinion that this is wrong, right. uh, a very strong uh, opinion about um, campaign finance and a need uh, for campaign finance, and he didn't like the super PACs. Uh, and so for a long time, the, there was no sort of presidential blessing for a super right. PAC to, to exist. Um, uh, and so we were actually late to the game. Priorities USA Action, which is the super PAC that is supporting Barack Obama, um, was sort of late to form and late to, to get started. Um, uh, and late to raise money, more importantly. Um, it was started by uh, two gentlemen, Sean Sweeney uh, and Bill Burton, who had come out of the White House, Bill out of the communications shop, Sean, who had served as chief of staff to Rahm Emanuel, or the single worst title in the planet, chief of staff to the chief of staff. Uh, and uh, a great job. Um, uh, and the two of them had, had um, left the White House, uh, they left the White House to, to start this super PAC. Uh, and begin the process of trying to help Barack Obama uh, get reelected. Uh, and it started off slow. Uh, the way to raise money is to go to donors that you might think are interested in helping the president, you know, uh, people who have donated before, people um, who uh, have shown an interest in trying to help the president. And it's a very different fundraising strategy. And I'm not a fundraiser, but uh, it's for, for a lot of, I mean, if you think about Barack Obama and the power of his campaign in 2008, what we know is how much of that was fueled by little donations, by people in this room sending $5 or $3 or whatever it is, and the enthusiasm of kind of small donors. Well, you can't do that if you're a super PAC. You're sort of spending your time trying to go out and raise six figures, seven figures checks, right? Like, so please give me a million dollars, which I don't know is a hard thing for, yeah. I, for me to ask for. Uh, you know, it's not a common thing. Sure, can I have 250 bucks for some charity I'm, I'm helping? Yeah, can I have a million bucks? You know, that's a tough conversation. And so, um, uh, so that's the way, the way that it happened. Um, in terms of the beginning and, and how it's grown. Now, since then, Priorities USA has become very successful in terms of uh, raising money. Uh, and more importantly, I think that Priorities has been an important part of setting the agenda f uh, in part or the tone for the presidential campaign. And I'm going to show you an ad um, that we did that I think had uh, a lot of influence or, or the subject of this had a lot of influence. So if we can call up the, uh, the ads for a minute, you're going to see, excuse me for one sec, so I'm going to show you an ad that Priorities um, put together. And for Priorities, it's going to be the one, it's going to be the ad on the left, not that one. No, nope, that's. So Priorities, we had done, as, as Maggie said, if you just, that'll be it. Yes, the video. If you just hold it for one second when it starts. and I'll, So Priorities, uh, as Maggie said, I serve as one of the pollsters for um, Priorities USA, so I do the polling and research along with the very talented and brilliant Jeff Guerin. Um, the two of us do the polling together, each of our respective firms. My firm also serves as the digital advertising firm, meaning whatever is being advertised on the internet 
uh, my firm is, uh, is helping to serve up to all of you. <laughs> um, and this ad is a really interesting one. In the research, what we found was something that I wish I could say that we found it. Newt Gingrich found it out. Um, Newt Gingrich ran a campaign against Mitt Romney about Mitt Romney's record on Bain, on Bain Capital, on his job, on his performance at Bain Capital, and how he made his money. And uh, Newt Gingrich assaulted Mitt Romney uh, with stuff, not only Newt, Newt Gingrich, but with the help of one of these super PACs, funded by a man named Sheldon Adelson, um, who's not a nice man. Um, uh, he Speak for yourself. <laughs> he, wasn't a nice man, he wasn't a nice man to Mitt Romney, as, as you all may recall, right? So, you know, they, there was a, the, the, he had, they actually had a, was it a 30 minute ad? Was it, there, wasn't there like a 30 minute ad in the beginning? Uh, about about Bain Capital that they put on the they put on the internet. But the point is, Newt Gingrich and some other Republicans had attacked Mitt Romney on his record at Bain. And what we found in our research was that it was an important part of the story to talk to people about how Mitt Romney had made his money was an important table setting point. It's not that anyone has anything against Mitt Romney for being rich, um, but we all make our choices. We all make our choices in terms of how we make money. Uh, and so this is one of the ads. It's probably the most powerful ad um, that I think we've done. Other um, consultants have talked about this, um, uh, saying it's very powerful. So check this out, <coughs> and then I'll talk about it. Out of the blue one day, we were told to build a 30-foot stage. Gathered the guys, and we built that 30-foot stage, not knowing what it was for. Just days later, all three shifts were told to assemble in the warehouse. A group of people walked out on that stage and told us that the plant is now closed and all of you are fired. I looked both ways. I looked at the crowd and uh, we all just lost our jobs. We don't have an income. Mitt Romney made over $100 million by shutting down our plant and devastated our lives. Turns out that when we built that stage, it was like building my own coffin. And it just made me sick. Priorities USA Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. So, um, pretty powerful ad called Stage. Um, powerful because it's a real story, powerful because it sets the table, as I said, in terms of what Mitt Romney's priorities were. Uh, and from a digital perspective, what's awesome is that this ad was seen two unique visitors two million times on YouTube. And most impressively, it was seen in the swing states. Uh, and so this is the kind of advertising that we decided to run in swing states, particularly in a place like Ohio, for example, uh, where blue collar downscale um, uh, voters were looking for this kind of information and saw the kind of priorities of Mitt Romney. Um, and I think this was very important at setting the stage um, for, for the rest of the campaign. Um, so look, it's a lot of fun to do what we do for a living. Um, Priority is, is, uh, has been a great experience. Um, uh, and as money has flown, uh, or uh, sort of flowed, I should say, into um, the super PACs in general, but also to priorities, I think we've had uh, played an important role uh, in this campaign. Not the kind of outsized role, though, that my colleague has at Crossroads. So I will uh, set up Jonathan here. So there's a little bit of a, a difference here, and maybe you can explain it. Uh, Jonathan works for American Crossroads, which is not the Romney Super PAC. There is a Romney Super PAC called Restore Our Future, which would be the, the counterpart to Priorities USA, which is very specific to that. Um, I would, American Crossroads has spent, has spent more money and is a, a, had, uh, has been around much longer. And uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the decision to do that. Obviously, it came up much earlier and I think saw a lot of what was going to happen before it actually <coughs> happened. And uh, so if you could talk a little bit about kind of the, the beginning of that and the decision, obviously there was no presidential candidate on the Republican side at that point, started much earlier, and then kind of the, the role that, that uh, Crossroads plays, not only in the presidential but beyond. I'll go back even uh, earlier than, uh, than 2010. I think to really understand 527 Independent Expenditure Committee Super PACs, you have to go back to 2002. Previous to uh, the Campaign Finance Reform <laughs> Act of 2002, uh, most of the outside money that you would talk about went through political parties. Mm -hmm. So if you were at the RNC or the DNC, you could solicit a million dollar contribution from a corporation or a business or a labor union or, in, or a wealthy individual and they would be able to give that to you, it would be disclosed and then you could spend that money how you wanted. 
uh, Congress decided that that was a good idea. They capped the amount that political parties could raise from individuals, but they couldn't cap the spending by outside groups because it's protected by the First Amendment. Uh, the idea that if any one of you wants to put an ad on the air to talk about what you believe in, that's protected by the First Amendment and you can't shut that down. Uh, what had happened over the, over the period of time, this is where I think it's really interesting because people think that it's a center-right thing that all these super, uh, that all these super PACs are going on. It was actually developed by the left. And what had happened in, uh, in 2004, the presidential re-elect of uh, President George W. Bush, three left-wing billionaires, uh, George Soros, uh, Peter Lewis, and Stephen Bing, raised $200 million to defeat President Bush through a series of organizations, MoveOn.org, America Coming Together, and a series of left-wing <coughs> groups that tried to uh, defeat uh, President Bush. So this type of structure, as Mike had said, had been around for a long period of time. Another thing that had gone on for even longer was the labor union's participation in the American political process, specifically helping Democrats. And what you find is that uh, in election after election, it is the biggest spending outside group are the big labor unions. And when uh, Karl Rove and Ed Gillespie started looking at the 2010 elections, they realized that while big labor, which had spent $400 million helping elect President Obama and the Democrats in 2008, there was no corollary to that that existed on the right to be able to spend large amounts of money on behalf of the Republican candidates running for House and Senate. Uh, so Rove and Gillespie smartly started uh, the group American Crossroads. Uh, we set a goal of $50 million in 2010. Uh, and uh, what was interesting, I, I was working at Crossroads uh, when President Obama actually uh, attacked uh, uh, Crossroads and said that we were taking illegal money from China, which is, which is funny. And um, as soon as he said that, within 10 days, I saw an uptick in uh, American Crossroads <laughs> fundraising. And the reason for that was because the President Obama, by attacking Crossroads, had identified us as the biggest threat to his existence. Um, and we ended up shattering our fundraising goals, uh, raising $70 million for the 2010 elections, and the rest is history. Uh, so that's really kind of where, where the center-right groups are. We view ourselves as a counterbalance to what the left has done very, very efficiently and very forcefully for decades. Uh, in fact, in 2010, people think of the, of, of the Crossroads groups as being the biggest spenders in the 2010 elections, but we weren't. Uh, the largest outside group expenditures uh, in the 2010 elections were by the bureaucrats union. It was by the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, the big labor union of the uh, bureaucrats at the state capitals. Um, the second biggest spending group was the U.S. Chamber, then the Crossroads groups. But then rounding out the top five were SEIU, the uh, Service Employees International Union, and the National Education, National Education Association, everybody's favorite teachers unions. Uh, so the three of the top five spending outside groups in 2010 were not super PACs, they were labor unions. One of the differences that you see between labor unions and super PACs is that what super PACs do is very, uh, it's disclosed every month, uh, we file all these FEC reports and a lot of what labor does is not disclosed in the same way. So they're able to spend lots more money uh, that's not as visible to the political process. We're definitely having counterpoints to well, all this <laughs> stuff later. I'm just going to respect you this time. But the counterpoint would be uh, the Wall they, they have more federal disclosure than you ever have on the election side with the federal DOL. All right. So <laughs> in Wall Street Journal uh, showed in, uh, in a piece in July that uh, uh, big labor had spent, I think, $4.4 billion, with a B, billion dollars, uh, between 2007 and 2011, uh, impacting the political process at the state, federal, local levels. Uh, so there is a lot of money in the politics, but a lot of people aren't talking about where the most money is coming from, which is the uh, labor unions. So I'll turn it back to Mike. Well, I think... Oh, we're actually, we have a spot that yeah. we can show. Yeah. Uh, so American Crossroads, uh, very, very active in the presidential, uh, in the presidential election. Uh, this is a spot that we launched today in eight states, $12 million. Uh, folks will be seeing this spot. This is what President Obama said the jobless rate would be if we pass a stimulus, 5.6%. But this is what the jobless rate actually is, 8.1%. The difference? About 3.7 million jobs. Obama's spending drove us $5 trillion deeper in debt, and now we have fewer jobs than when he started. What Obama promised versus what he delivered. American Crossroads is responsible for the content of this advertising. So what this ad does is it holds the president to account for a very big promise that he made. When they were selling the stimulus legislation, remember, you were talking about how bad the economy is today. Uh, the president had a plan to fix it. We all forget about it. It's called the stimulus legislation. They spent $800 billion on all kinds of different things to try to fix the economy. They spent the money, and the jobs didn't follow. What we did get was debt. And we found from our research that uh, when you talk about it in those terms, here's what the president sold to the American people on how to fix the economy. These are the results of it. Not only did it not create the jobs that he promised, it actually created a lot of debt that we now have to pay off. Spent a lot of money, not a lot of results. 
that's kind of our messaging. Uh, we try to hold elected officials to account for their record and also for uh, the promises that they've made. That's why a lot of incumbent politicians don't like super PACs because they're capable of doing that on a very large level. So we have, uh, I think, important to note that the, the, one of the things we talk about in this class, again, is, is targeting is always hugely important. And living here between the New York and Philadelphia media right. market, you're not going to see any of these, most likely. <laughs> Potentially, you know, Pennsylvania historically has been a target state right now. Neither, neither campaign nor the super PACs really advertising in Pennsylvania, certainly not the Philadelphia media market, which is the most expensive market in the target states. But to hear you guys talking about eight or nine states, I think that's also important to remember. This is a, this is a, a, a lot of money that is concentrated uh, to a very small number of states and ultimately a small number of people in that small number of states as well. But that's something that's, uh, I think, very important for everybody here to remember. But a big part that you're hearing, and Jonathan talked about, was campaign finance reform and the unintended consequences. So the students in the class know that that's one of my uh, pet peeves, are the unintended consequences sometimes of well-intentioned legislation. And that's something we can get into as we ask questions. But we want to open it up to questions. We're going to have, uh, we're going to give Maggie a chance here to respond. Um, but we're going to, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to become the moderator here, but somehow that may happen. Um, but we're going to open it up to questions. We'd love the, the students to take yes. questions first, uh, first dibs on the students in the class, but anybody else feel free as well. The microphones are there. If you want to uh, get yourself on C-SPAN, wave. You know, don't say hello to your, anybody you know, but you can tell people when it's going to run. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be great. Uh, so we want to open it up to questions for anybody, whether it's on campaign finance reform or specifically about the presidential race or any other races where you know where there might be any of these outside groups or past outside groups in 2004 or others. And now I'll turn the floor over to Maggie on labor. Well, uh, just a couple points, right? I mean, one of the things that's fascinating to me when folks discuss this issue is they talk often about the role of of big unions and labor. Um, and what's interesting about organized labor is they've been under a series of rules uh, for years, especially under the Federal Department of Labor, and those rules have gotten more and more strict. So for example, if you're a rank and file member of a union, you have what's called an opt-out dues checkoff in order to agree to let your money, five cents per hour, or whatever it might be, be used for political purposes. But when I go to the store to buy a soda, I didn't sign on to whatever company that's selling me that soda's political agenda, right? I didn't choose that. So how a company makes revenue, right, and then takes that revenue and is now putting it into massive amounts of it into an agenda and corrupting the political process potentially with a massive influence of wealthy, wealthy dollars coming from large-scale corporations is, is not a comparison you can make to unions per se in terms of how they fund traditional political activity. Now, Citizen United did for unions what it did for corporations as well. Unions can now spend political money out of any of their accounts. Um, but they do have to report for it, and they report for it extensively out of the Federal Department of Labor. But Jeff and I were talking about this earlier, about who's winning this money race. Do you want to walk through some of those numbers? Well, I mean, look, you can, if you put up the one chart, and this is, I, these aren't my numbers. This is from the Washington Post, and you can take anything you want. I mean, I have from Open Secrets, but if you put up that picture, you can see what the ad spending, I hope it will come up. I won't mess it up by walking if I do. Well, oh well. Look up top, right? These right there tells you the amount of spending, ad spending, that's been done. American Crossroads, 59. Restore Our Future, 41. Americans for Prosperity, 36. Those are the top three. All of those Republican. You then get to 22.7 for the DNC, 21 for the RNC, 17.5 um, uh, for the RNC Mitt Romney Committee. Four of those five uh, are Republican entities. And yes, Barack Obama's had a, a lot of money too, and I'm not, I'm not trying to <coughs> put to blow past that. Uh, obviously, the Obama campaigns had a tremendous amount of money. But when you look at the super PACs, it is very clear that the Republicans have dominated. I mean, Restore Our Future has spent $87 million this cycle. A part of that was beating up Newt Gingrich, but still, <laughs> or Rick Perry, or whoever was the flavor of the week in the Republican primary. But... $87 million, and Crossroads, $30 million overall. And after that, Club for Growth, $12.3 million. These are massive amounts of money in this cycle. Uh, and so I just think that's, it, it is what it is. It's the reality that we're dealing with. It's the, the why we're here today to talk about it. And it's a very difficult um, thing for campaigns to deal with. Well, something that, that's, I think, a, a, an important point to make <coughs> is that you did say, I mean, I think when looking at the practical matter of this campaign, the president's campaign, President Obama's campaign is outspending pretty significantly Governor Romney's <coughs> campaign on television. But you're right, with the, with the outside groups, it's actually, if you aggregate the president and the groups on the left and Governor Romney and the groups on the right, it actually is Governor Romney's side, if you will, that, that has heavier weight on television. Right. It's, it's relatively close, but it is, it is you know, an aggregate that there is on that side. But that is a, an important part. I mean, campaign finance reform, you talked about, this is very important. They used to, this used to be the, the, the party 
committees, Republican National Committee right. and the Democrat National Committee used to be able to do this. And I think that's important to know that as well-intentioned as campaign finance reform is, basically the, the, the entities that are most accountable to the voters are the candidates themselves. They have to go out, they have to stand behind their ads, they have to put their faces in the ads, and they have to say, you know, I authorize this. And they're ultimately the people who are voted on. The kind of next layer out would be the party committees because they're controlled, if you will, by the elected officials and by the party folks. They are actually held to account they're the closest thing other than the candidates to being held to account by the voters. This well-intentioned campaign finance reform took all that money and put it out. And what you saw is the DGA and the RGA figured that out in terms of the party committee side. Um, <laughs> they figured that out right away. And you, and you have done this. And, and this, has been, this is the result of a lot of people who are well-intentioned thinking that money has no place in politics. And what they did is they ended up putting money outside. So they're outside of the candidates. The, the share of uh, spending by the candidates in the past you know, well before 2002, was basically, you know, closer to 50-50. One, one candidate would spend about half the money, the other candidate would spend half the money. If you're on the wrong side of John Corzine, it's more like 75-25. <laughs> but, you know, you basically... Jealous. It's the, he's bitter. <laughs> I, mean, I am very You won. <laughs> Not the first time. And, uh, <laughs> that you're jealous and bitter or that you won? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the, um, so you have this, but then as you started to move back, then you had the party committees doing independent expenditure and ads, which, you know, in, which actually I think still is an unintended consequence and a mistake. They should be able to to work with the candidates and the campaigns. But what you have is then you start squeezing the amount of money that's being spent by the candidates, and now the party committees were filling that up. And now you have the outside group. So what's happening is rather than each candidate trying to get about 50% of what's being set on the air, each candidate's now getting... 20% of what's being spent Maybe. on the air. And the other 60% are party committees outside, probably even less. In a lot of races, it's even less. You could be getting down to 15%. If you're being outspent by your opponent, you might be down to 10%. It really is. It really has taken the, the, the people who are most important in this process, which are the candidates, and, and made them less and less relevant, and certainly less and less of advocates on their own behalf. And, and the outside groups, it becomes an arms race. Both outside groups are right. Neither side should just stand down and let the other side have a huge advantage. They're both right to raise as much money as they can and advocate for their their side. That's our right yeah. in the political process. And if we did anything else, it would be malpractice on our side. But it, but this is in many ways kind of the, the, the outgrowth of campaign finance reform. And there's a lack of accountability, right? So if you're an average voter, right, and you see an advertisement from a candidate, it tends to be that even if they're going to be contrasting or negative, the candidate has to own the message of that ad. If, in fact, you're going to have a large-scale outside group that you don't even know how it got funded throwing up attack ads, how does the voter distinguish between what could be accurate, what's not accurate, what's motivating that ad, who's the person saying that there should not be a millionaire's tax or there should be a millionaire's tax, who is the special interest that's dominating that message point that's coming out, and how do the voters sift through it? And I think one of the most amazing things that's happening right now in this country is when you look at the president's numbers in these swing states, he's doing quite well. And what's fascinating about the amount of money that's been spent by Restore Our Future, by Crossroads, by all these entities, is that for some reason that message is not cutting through. It's not compelling. And if you look at some of these swing states that we thought were going to be remarkably, remarkably close at this point, are really starting to trend, trend towards Obama in a way that everyone seems to think that unless these debates reset this presidential election, it's quite clear that, that the president is really headed towards uh, creating an environment where on this electoral map he has a significant advantage. I'm sorry, Governor Christie promised that it would... Oh, this is right. Mitt Romney is going to be so exceptional tomorrow that there's going to be a seismic change. You watch. Tune Governor in, baby. Tune seismic in. shift. Watch. Seismic. Just watch. I'm excited. Talk about it next week in class. Hey, Jonathan, would you also <laughs> talk a bit about, since Crossroads is different and you also engage in more localized races, state, con I mean, uh, congressional and Senate, a bit about how you choose your priorities since you have a broader scope than uh, yeah, that, that's a, Obama Yeah, that, that's a good question. So we're primarily focused on the presidential election. Uh, you know, the goal of American Crossroads is to uh, defeat President Obama and to elect a new president, but we're also heavily in, invested in uh, Senate and House races. I think in a way that a lot of other super PACs aren't. I don't think Priorities USA, for example, yeah, right, in the no, House or Senate, no. uh, Restore Our Future is exclusively de uh, dedicated to the presidential. So we're, we're focused on all, uh, on all of them. The, the Senate races are where you're going to see a lot more of the advertising uh, earlier on, just because Senate races, people, the bigger the office, the more people pay attention earlier. Uh, but we'll also be uh, engaged in a number of, uh, of House races, probably a little bit later as we get closer. Yeah, I mean, look, the, that's the other thing. I mean, Crossroads plays this, um, this outsized role in these Senate races. And don't think that these two are not entwined. I'm not suggesting anything nefarious, but the, when, even if, let's just say, there was parity between the Democrats and Republicans in terms of presidential advertising, the Republican side, the Crossroads and others, are way outspending on the, on the Senate races and House races. And those all have an impact, right? Because it's the environment. It's how do people feel when there's 
millions of dollars of ad spending in the state of Montana, for example, on the, uh, on the Senate race, it affects the House race. It affects other races below it. Uh, and so that's one of the, the I, in, I don't know that it's unintended consequence, but it's certainly a consequence of super PAC spending like this. Um, but the, but the, when the campaigns, and I work for far more campaigns than I do independent expenditures, um, the, the, when we deal with campaigns, what we always talk about is, when is Crossroads going to come up? When is Crossroads going to be there? Because we're not really, half of our planning and half of our discussion is about what the outside entities are going to do. And what, what Mike said, which is absolutely right, is we used to just plan on the other side in terms of the campaign. We used to kind of have a, okay, we're going to do, they're going to do. But now we're, we're all planning for a sort of multi-level chess field, um, which makes our job more fun. And there, are number, and there are a number of them, and, they, and there are more and more. There are, and there are super PACs on the, uh, on the left now that have cropped up in Senate races, and there are multiple super PACs on both sides, so not it's not count, just... Also, not to count the environmental groups, I think the right. environmental groups are the biggest outside spender in New Mexico in that Senate race. And I think that the biggest outside spender in House races is the Democratic... House, House majority PAC, at, at the, I, I believe today, but... Yeah. Which is a super PAC. But, yeah. you, but you haven't but hit that ground you, yet. But you, <laughs> and I, but you just said that you guys haven't started. I mean, it's not... Or largely haven't started. Today. So... So I mean I, I don't I don't think that will be at the end of the day in these in the Senate races for sure um, you guys have been the you know the monster player. The other thing I think that's important for everybody to realize is too is that there are very very specific rules that everybody has yeah. to abide by if you're involved in a super PAC or if you're involved in an independent expenditure and everybody on both sides takes these rules very very seriously and uh, it, it really is it, it is interesting to watch it is a big chessboard now and there's a lot more a lot more players involved in this but having to live by all these rules that make these independent expenditures truly independent is something that's important for uh, for everybody to kind of remember because all sides are trying to look at this and I remember I, after the 2004 election I, I appeared on a panel panel with uh, somebody who was a field organizer for Americans Coming Together, one of the outside Democrat groups, which was doing a lot of field organizing, organizing and they lamented that the, that the field organizing was done by the RNC on the Republican side and by the outside groups on the Democrat side, and that they could not, they legally could not communicate with, uh, with the campaign, and they were not, they were not able to, uh, to do that. And in their mind, the campaign wasn't doing the right things, and because they outsourced the field operation, it was a big difference for them. So everybody follows these, uh, these, organ these rules well. Does anybody have any questions, any students? You're going to get huge demerits if you don't answer your ask you questions. You've got to come so down to the microphone you come down you to the, uh, you have please to go stand to the, up and head to the mic. Let's go to the microphone. And please try to keep uh, your, your questions as concise as you can so everybody can get a chance, if you don't mind. And don't curse. And Maggie hasn't cursed yet, <laughs> so nobody you. else can either. No cursing. <laughs> First of all, thank you for being here. Uh, the particular question I had was, uh, you know, the Citizens United States really allowed corporations to, you know, fund um, a lot of these political campaigns. My corporations are people, didn't you hear? Yeah. Right. <laughs> my particular Mitt Romney said it. The Supreme Court said it. Yeah. My particular question uh, deals primarily um, because I'm really interested in international relations and maybe international corporations um, that are maybe stationed in the United States. Have there ever been like international corporations that have funded these particular super PACs? And has there been like pro nation? Um, like, have been certain countries have been, uh, you know, vibing for a particular candidate? Like, say, a, a separate nation in, in, in the international <laughs> realm have a particular interest for a particular so candidate to be elected in the U.S.? Have you been getting money from Chavez? Is that what it is? <laughs> Just the Cayman Islands. <laughs> <laughs> two, two, two parts. First, I don't know that corporations are giving to super PACs in the degree that uh, you're suggesting. I think if you were to look at super PACs and to see corporate entities, there's some money going into them, but I don't know that it's as much as you would uh, suggest. So I don't know that, that Citizens United had quite the degree of impact that a lot of people said. I would recommend uh, a piece by Matt Bai, uh, who wrote a piece on the impact of uh, super PACs and outside groups. Actually, the impact of Citizens United in New York Times Magazine, I think, mm -hmm. back in July. It's, it's, a, it's a good piece. It's worth reading. Uh, the second thing is we don't take money from foreign entities very, very plainly stated uh, on all of our literature and on our website. I think it's the same with Yep. Yeah. No money from foreign nationals. Question right here? Yeah. Um, so I just had a quick question. Uh, we were talking about how it's changed the field a little bit and even some words of how it's corrupted the political uh, field, but at the same time, it's, it's created kind of some jobs for you guys. So talking about that, um, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's be a, li a little more honest about that. How do you feel about well, would you would you be in favor of getting rid of this uh, super PAC thing? And if so, what would you favor in response to it? Or what would you have take its place? The amazing part about campaign finance reform is that it is always evolving. I mean, so as soon as, let's assume for a second that a new set of laws is passed. Um, with, as quickly as they're passed, election lawyers figure out how to get around them. 
I mean, it's remarkable. And so campaign finance is a constantly evolving issue. Would I personally support moving the money back into the candidate committees? Absolutely. Um, I, I think there's got to be a mechanism, and I've worked for you know, two millionaire politicians uh, in, in my life, right? I, I believe there should be a mechanism for rank and file people should you be opposing someone who's self-funding, who's a millionaire, to be able to raise larger amounts. But I believe putting the money back in the candidate accounts would create a ton more accountability for the electorate uh, and a much, uh, a much more integrity-driven process in terms of the issues you're looking at to frame an election. So me personally, yes. And, you know, does my firm make money off of these kinds of campaigns? They absolutely do. But from my perspective, um, I, I think it's better for the country if we went back to that model. I don't, can, I, can I answer it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that I necessarily agree with the, with the, with the assumption of the question, though. I mean, if you look at what, I don't know if you saw the, the American Crossroads ad, you look at what, what super PACs actually do and what the advertising does. I, everyone in here, I think a lot of people in here are political science students. Do you remember the, the, the question in Political Science 101, should the elected representative do what he believes is right or what the constituents think is right? Everyone remember that question? And you could answer the question one way or the other. The important thing to take away from that is that there's a tension between what the elected representative wants to do and what his constituents want to do. Nobody wants to run for office so they can, you know, cast the lever for what the constituents want to do. A robot could do that. You want to be a candidate because you believe in something. You, you're a Republican, you want to believe in, in cutting taxes, you're a Democrat, you want to, you know, increase social progress, whatever you want to do. Nobody wants to just pull the lever for what the constituents want to do. So all a super PAC really can do is identify places where the elected representative has gone out too far from his constituency and then educate the electorate about how the elected representative is sideways with the will, you know, with the public opinion of the people. So you take that ad that, that Crossroads ran, uh, ran, we were running it in, in all these states, talking about how the president passed this stimulus program. The stimulus thing was wildly unpopular. And all the ad from the super PAC can do is hold the president or another elected official to account for what they did. It can't change public opinion about the, about the stimulus legislation, but we can identify places where an elected representative is sideways with his constituents and make and let people know about it. So I don't I don't know that I agree with the with the premise of the question that it's necessarily bad because I think it I think it brings to light a lot of things that people wouldn't otherwise know. Well, I think on, on the accountability front, I, I think uh, I think there should be full disclosure as there is in a lot of these entities already. But I think if you allow that to flow into the candidates, it would allow challengers, it would allow underfunded candidates. If you were to if you were to just you know if you wave a wand, I think if you were to if you were to get rid of limits and allow people to essentially contribute as much as they want to the candidate, as long as it was immediately disclosed. The press and their opponents could then decide whether or not that that is having an undue influence on the on the elected official. I think that would bring more accountability back to the candidates. The, the other thing you have to look at is also the, the way candidates raise money, and they raise money through what, what are called you know, the traditional PACs, the corporate uh, or union PACs that uh, that exist in Washington D.C. And, and and give checks to, to candidates, mostly to incumbents. Uh, we looked at, reg at traditional PAC giving in 2010. Remember, Democrats held large majorities in the House and the Senate in 2010. And traditional PACs, which are mostly corporate PACs, uh, gave to the Democrats at a, at a proportion of 57% to the Democrats, 43% to the Republicans. Mostly corporate PACs giving to Democrats, not to Republicans. They don't care about that, they're, that the Democrats are Republicans, they care that they're incumbents. Yeah. And they're working with incumbents. So it makes it, so it's, so it's almost like the game is very tilted against anybody who wants to try to crack into the process. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's difficult, and, and, and super PACs, are not liked by incumbents because they can come in and hold the office holder to account for some votes that they may have taken, a vote on Obamacare or a vote on the stimulus or something like that. Uh, the incumbent doesn't like that. The traditional PACs are always going to go and give, for the, give the money to the incumbent anyway. But, but the hope would be, I mean, look, it's still, it's still perverse. I mean, we, I would still rather have the opponent pointing out those things than a super PAC. I would rather the two sides of a campaign be battling that out than some other entities. So there are many solutions. Public financing is one solution. Good or bad, you know, that's one solution. The disclosure um, certainly is, is, is one thing. So, I mean, there are multiple solutions, but to me it is frustrating that the candidate's voice has been muted. And I, uh, The presidential is a whole different ballgame in terms of the money and everything it's spent and the, the impact of free media, frankly, on it. Um, so, I, I, but on the, on the Senate race and the House races, I just want these two men, two ladies, man and lady, to, to talk to one another and to fight it out between each other. And I think we probably would get a little more vision out of them 
and a little more contrast, but it would be like, here's what I think, here's what she thinks. That's a really good point, too, about the presidential race. I think, um, this is an opinion, but yeah, I think, the, I think the, the advertising actually probably matters less in a presidential yeah. race than any other race because people are actually watching the presidential race. Um, when you get down to U.S. Senate races, especially in a place like New Jersey, it is very difficult for either candidate to have enough money to spend to have advertising. Outside groups make calculated decisions about how much um, it costs in the, uh, in the New York media market versus the Bismarck media market in terms of where they can, where they can spend their advertising advertising dollars, and it, is, it does become much harder um, for candidates to get their voices heard without large dollars for advertising. On the presidential race, you actually have earned media coverage every day. We don't see that. We don't see that in, in our state. E even the governor's race, really until the end, you don't really see kind of day-to-day -day following. We have a lot of uh, sort of super PAC independent expenditure activity in New Jersey, uh, not on television, because it's, uh, it's so not affordable in the state to, to be on New York or Philly. There's a ton. Uh, of field programs, of mail programs, of phone programs, of digital programs, predominantly field as of late, uh, where you can really change outcomes. Uh, and I think that that happened. It was evidenced by uh, uh, the, the race between Congressman Pascrell and Congressman Rothman, where there was a Democratic primary, and Congressman Pascrell won on, on, the, on the basis of a remarkable uh, field operation by a variety of entities, which just changed the dynamics of, of the situation of that race. And, and that wasn't even the intention, as I understand, of the field program, but it had a huge impact. So in New Jersey, I think the media markets, the costs are so prohibitive that, that, we're, that other mechanisms are being used. Why don't we go to the mic, though, since we have a line developing, oh, uh, right. if you will, sir? Uh, hello. Uh, my question is, do you believe that corporations should be counted as people or not? You, I'm going to let them start. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, I think it's more of a legal question. I don't know that I even have it. it there, there are legal reasons why they count corporations as people in courts. I, it's, it's kind of beyond my expertise to even have an opinion on that. We're all, living, we're all living under the same rules. We're all living under the same rules that the Supreme Court passed down. Okay. Well, 47% of the people aren't even relevant to one candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Start right Not there. Not true. But if you count corporations as people, maybe he can add in a couple of points back if he does it that way. And I will say, so, I will say something. That, since, you, since you brought up the 47%, I do, because I haven't heard Governor Romney say this. I think somebody needs to say it. This is a guy on the 47%. This is a guy who gives, you know, Four plus million dollars of his own money to charity last year gives. Yes. Mi oh, mi I, listen to me. Gives millions and millions of dollars. It is preposterous to say that somebody gives millions and millions of dollars to charity doesn't care about people who. Maybe Mike, we didn't say it. Anything. Mitt Romney said it. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but the, <laughs> thing, the problem about, about, about that, 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 about problem about that, that quote is, is two things and what it says to the public. What it says to the public is the Mitt Romney you see on a stage in a debate or in a national convention or in a TV ad is saying one thing. But the Mitt Romney behind closed doors when he thinks there's no press in the room is saying something entirely different. Well, I don't know about that, mate, because it depends on the day. Sometimes Mitt Romney says one thing <laughs> one day and one thing well, the other day. Possible. So it is both public and private. The 47%, the though, the, the important point goes to actually, it proves your point, Mike, which is the, there hasn't been, I mean, Priorities actually did do an ad on, on the 47% thing, but you've seen, but, but uh, small media buy in terms of amount of dollars spent, the amount of, New York, of, of, of voters nationwide who know about this because of the earned media coverage in a presidential race, it's remarkable. There were, I think Quinnipiac did a whole bunch of surveys, or Marist, one of the two, did a whole bunch of surveys that tested whether or not people had heard about the 47% in the swing states, and the numbers were astronomically high. Uh, and so, I mean, that's the thing. And, that, and I do think that that comment was emblematic of sort of what people had already built in in their feelings. If you had any uncertainty, it was... Mitt Romney isn't like me. He doesn't get me. He doesn't get the middle class. And that, that one comment encapsulated it all. And that's, and know, he was talking, that's his problem. He was, talking from an, he was talking like a political strategist and, and not as a presidential he candidate. He wasn't. That's the, that was the lame excuse, but he wasn't. I mean, if he had said what we all say, which is, look, 47% of the people are not voting for me. I know that because 47% of the people are not voting for Barack Obama. That would be fine, but that's not what he said. Like, he, he went much further than that, and, and, the, and the sort of simple dismissing of, look, there's 45% on one side, 45% on the other, we're all fighting over 10%, we've all said that. That's not what he said. He said, the people who don't pay taxes, they're irrelevant. The, and many of those people... He didn't say that either. He base. didn't say that either. You're taking some liberties on that. Why don't, why don't, we, uh, why don't we, sir, we take the next question if we can. Thank you very much. 
Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I am a, a grad student, a member of one of those evil unions. So I just thought I should say that. I work so with unions I, all the time. My position stand is up, probably stand proud, stand proud. Everyone deserves to have health care in my view and a living absolutely. wage. Absolutely. I just wanted to make it clear. <laughs> it's America, after all. My question is New Jersey, after all. A bit towards <laughs> absolutely, the, baby. Towards the Republican strategist, because I'm surrounded by people who kind of have the same ideological bent as me, and I just don't understand the recent. Um, I've been following these recent voter ID laws. And you're seeing that there's a linkage there with, with the super PACs because you're seeing people like the Koch brothers funding the super PACs, but also these initiatives to, um, to, to get these voter ID laws passed. So my question is kind of twofold. Is this blatant, pretty blatant, I mean, this is what Republican leaders are saying, attempt at voter disenfranchisement, an explicit strategy of the Republicans that's emerging as something that we're going to see in future elections and just to challenge you how do you justify it i would uh, i'll take that i'm happy to take the first part crack at least <laughs> i don't know anybody would has said that you said republican leaders say this is blatant voter disenfranchisement no no republican no, has said that oh you're they're saying, saying that. that they do not want peop certain people to vote we they're saying you. this Here, here's and here's, i don't understand how you can justify i don't know that that's what they're saying they're saying yeah, they're saying Virginia, no no I, okay yeah that's your question i'll uh, <laughs> i'll give i'll give my response the um <laughs> what they're the saying here, here's what here's what happens I have seen firsthand voter fraud. It is probably not as rampant as a lot of people would have you believe, just like um, the threats on Republicans trying to disenfranchise people is not as rampant as what you're trying to see. What you have here is you have a tug between both sides and both sides thinking the other side is doing something wrong. I've, I've witnessed it. I've watched it. I've watched people casting illegal votes and physically tried to stop it. Now, that doesn't mean every Democrat is a crook and that every Democrat who won, won by cheating. But it happens. And if you pretend it's not happening, you're only kidding yourself. And so what you have is a push on the other side to try to stop people from cheating. Now, you can argue whether that goes too far. That's not the right remedy. But that's what it is. It is a very difficult tug between both sides in terms of how do you stop that. I mean, that's just, look, I, I love Mike Duhame, but that is absurd. If you want to stop fraud, then do that. Stop fraud. But to actually decide the only way you can win an election is to disenfranchise people's right to vote? That's, that's the way you is. can get there? Well, guess what? That's pretty embarrassing, and that's why this country is going to reelect Barack Obama. Because there's a whole series of tactics out here that are completely outrageous and against everything we value as a country. And if the only way you're going to get there and you're going to get to win is by disenfranchising a series of voters then, you know, I think that's a terribly is, sad and campaign. And first of all, that is not the intent. We don't have that here, so I'm, I'm, not, as, I'm not as familiar with it as what's going on in other states, but that is not the intent. The intent I don't think you would the, ever do that, intent, by the way. The, the intent is to stop. I don't think you're that kind of Republican. The, the intent is to stop people. The intent is to stop multiple people from voting, to stop dead people from voting. Then if you want to go after the fraud, fraud, go after the fraud. Well, do well, here, enforcement. Here's the problem. When you go after the lawyers all when you the go voting fraud, in the ballot box, in the, no in the city of Brotherly Love, where you're from, so you can comment on it or not, in the city of Philadelphia, where everything is run by the city, and the judge of elections end up becoming uh, the Democrat committee people, and what used to be the case that polling locations were literally in people's garages, you had, you had no accountability. You had one party control, and you had zero accountability. You had nobody watching the election. So you can complain that somebody's trying and maybe steering too much into the swerve, but what you have was no accountability and one party rule in a number of places in this country. And you, know, you can say Republicans are wrong for doing this. There's a lot wrong that's happened on that side. And so you're trying both sides. What you're saying is not that easy to have that accountability when, when oh, I agree when, it's not when, easy, when but just because it's hard doesn't mean you choose this path. Both, both, both sides, look, both sides are right, right? There, there is some fraud. My side's more right. There, My no. side's more right. <laughs> Chris Christie's announcing tomorrow he's going to There's certainly some <laughs> fraud, and there are certainly the tactics that they're choosing seem to be abhorrent. I mean, the notion of a modified poll tax, which is what some of this is, is, is not the right way to, to, to go. And in fact, the Pennsylvania law, I believe, was stopped, was, uh, was, there was a stay on it today in Pennsylvania. So uh, it's the wrong tactic, and I hope that they change their ways, because frankly, none of us actually think voter suppression is the way to go. Um, it's not the way to win elections. It's not, I'm positive that Jonathan doesn't spend time thinking about how they can suppress voters, and we certainly don't. Right. Um, it just isn't worth it, frankly. Uh, but that solution, the solution of voter IDs, is absolutely the wrong one. Sir? Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. I know you have busy schedules. Uh, before I ask my question, I'd like to read you a quote from Eric Schultz on this issue. He said, in the aftermath of the Citizens United decision, we have seen unprecedented amounts of campaign spending, often by groups that won't disclose their donors. So my question is, how important is anonymity? Because it seems to me like if your argument is money is free speech, then we should hold people accountable for what they say. 
if the CEO of Pepsi were to give a million dollars to Mitt Romney tomorrow, I wouldn't buy Pepsi for the rest of the year. So how are we going to hold them accountable? Just the year? <laughs> <laughs> He's not that committed. He's really not that committed. I really. We got to work really on it. Pepsi. There are certain Mountain sodas Duke. that I cannot go without. <laughs> Other Pepsi products might be okay, though. Just, just Pepsi itself. Not in New York City. Not if they're really yeah. large. And yeah. It's got to be 16 ounces. Can't be any more than that. But what I'm saying is, how can we hold these people accountable when we do not know what they're saying? Well, I take that. Uh, yeah, I'll take a crack at that. So, so lo long story short, there, this election cycle, there are a lot of different groups that are organized differently under the tax laws. The super PACs, the Independent Expenditure 527 Committees, which is what they call them, all of those report to the FEC and they report usually monthly or quarterly and they disclose their donors and so on and so forth. There are also nonprofit organizations, a whole host of them, uh, that are organized under a different part of the tax code. They're organized as 501c4 issue advocacy organizations. They're private organizations that aren't required to disclose their members or their donors. This is, this, this is a, a type of tax law that's protected going back to the 1950s. It's been argued. There's a whole logic behind it. Uh, and it's not done by the right. It's not done by the left. It's, it's, it's done by all types of these 501c4 organizations. There are 137,000 of them. Uh, environmental groups are organized the same way as some of the center-right groups are, where they, they don't disclose their donors. Uh, and what the IRS is, has kind of issued is that they, they said that if you're a political organization, if, if you're a nonprofit organization, you're allowed to spend some of your resources on political activity. can't be the majority of what, you do, uh, of what you do, but it can be some of what you do. And that's what's happening with those 501c4 organizations, is they're following the laws that exist to govern nonprofit groups. Yeah, there's, and there's a, an investigation <coughs> already by the New York State Attorney General, uh, Eric Schneiderman, into, into some of this uh, and sort of whether um, this kind of spending, whether it's all kosher, frankly, um, the, the kind of money that's being spent and is it right and all the proportions. Um, but, I mean, Jonathan described it perfectly well. I mean, it's, it's true. There is something remarkable, though. You know, the Republicans forever and ever was about disclose, 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 and <laughs> now... We can't get the Disclose Act pact passed in the Senate, um, thanks to the Republicans or in the House at all. So uh, those are the kind of things that, that I think are frustrating, because I think big picture, we certainly, sunshine that, would be better for all of us. Was that the first place where we were looking for some bipartisanship over the last four years? Which that was one? Gonna be, that was going to be the, that yeah, was gonna that be the was one, not, that was going to be the one, <laughs> that, be the that, one was place, that was the one place where President Obama was going to reach across the aisle. That was it. That was going to be great. By the way, I think, <laughs> I think you had already answered your own question, right? I mean, there, of course. I mean, why, would, why do you do anything anonymous? Because you don't want to be caught. They don't, you don't want someone to know what you're doing, right? So there could be a variety of reasons for that, um, but it takes away a remarkable amount of accountability in the system, because if you don't actually know who's financing something that you're watching and viewing, you have no sense of where it's coming from, why it's there, who's funding it, what their motives are, what's the special interest, what's actually happening behind the curtain. And again, I'd be curious, a lot of the questions that come, come from that angle, if you will, are the same people who advocate the most fearly for campaign finance reform, McCain-Feingold in 2002, advocate the most fearly for what are very restrictive uh, campaign finance laws. And, and that's what I mean about the unintended consequence. Right. It's just going to put the money away from the candidates, and it's going to put, in some cases, away from disclosure. The, the entities these guys work for have to disclose, but there are, there are other groups out there that, they have, that live under different rules, and they also have to abide by different rules in terms of how they communicate, but, but what, they are different. One other thing, just, just going back to that, I, I believe that the, that the amount that candidates can raise from individuals, is it the same as it was in 1978? It's, whenever up, they were, it's up a little bit. It's up a little bit. It goes, so, it goes to like it goes inflation adjusted. A little bit. And, okay, so, so but uh, back in the 70s, people were able to give like $2,000 to candidates. Now they can give $2,400 to yeah, candidates. Right, yeah. So yes. over a lifetime, it still, hasn't, it still hasn't changed very much. Yeah, minor. Next. With the advent of all this outside spending by these various political groups, do you think we've seen the end of public, publicly financed campaigns? And what reforms do you see might happen in the area of campaign finance in the next few years? Maggie, you love this if you want. I don't think we've seen the, I don't think we've seen the end. I don't think we've seen the end either. Um, but will any candidate realistically go back to public finance campaign? Well, why wouldn't they? I mean, they New York has some places. We, in New York City, where I live, we have, we, we have it. I, I um, think you, you mean on the presidential, presidential level. On the presidential, oh, you mean with the checkbox? Right, going uh, back to 2008, oh. or at least the I think, Obama backtrack. Yes. No, you, yeah, we're, I think we're done with that. We're done with that. I don't yeah, think any, totally. I mean, Senator McCain opted in to the finance system, and, and one of the untold stories, I think, of the 2008 race, not that I don't think it would have changed the outcome, but Senator McCain was dramatically outspent in every target state. The decision for the Obama campaign to go outside and McCain to stay inside um, 
was a was not a good decision in terms of the what it meant ultimately at the end of the day because he was dramatically outspent. And so I do think nobody is going to do that ever again yeah. um, unless the limits unless it changes <laughs> dramatically in yeah. terms of the amount. But you do have it on the local level. You guys may want to talk about where your experience is yeah. on on state levels. Well, state you, and New York. So you had yeah, to take yeah. the public matching funds. I didn't in 09, so you might yeah, want to talk about what it's like in New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey, we actually have, for governor, we have matching funds. We it's don't have program. it on the legislative level. We've had a couple pilot programs on the legislative level where you had to raise a certain amount of local dollar contributions. On the gubernatorial level, there is matching funds in New Jersey that if you raise a certain threshold, which is the $300,000 to $350,000, yeah. the state will actually match you two for one. So if you raise that amount of money, all yeah. of a sudden you basically have a million dollars. So it actually makes you know a candidate... If you can reach kind of a, a, a certain threshold of seriousness in terms of the ability to demonstrate that you have enough support that you can raise a certain amount of money, you can become viable very quick. And uh, you saw that in the, in the gubernatorial primary in 2009. And even in the, in the um, Christie general election in 2000, uh, 2009, Christie had around $11 million to spend between what he raised and the match, which, is, which really is a lot more than most campaigns get in New Jersey on a U.S. Senate race. They'll very rarely ever get that high. I think Senator Menendez will. But that actually gets to the point of being enough to get your message out. In this, in this state with Philadelphia and New York, the first and fourth most expensive markets in the country, you really need to hit about, you know, in the neighborhood of $10 million to get your message out. So in New Jersey, the public financing essentially gives, gives candidates the ability to get to that threshold level. You can opt out. Senator Corzine opted out. Uh, Governor Corzine opted out. Um, but it remains to be seen kind of how that goes going forward. But we don't have it on the legislative level. It also has a remarkably positive impact on the campaign when you have public financing because the candidate doesn't have to spend, ma I mean, I can't tell you how much time candidates spend fundraising. It is massive. I remember when uh, when Frank Lautenberg first retired. He has since come back from his sabbatical, right, uh, in 2002. But when he when he first retired, the reason why he retired was because he would have had to raise $12 million. And when you looked at his actual schedule for the year, the year before in which the year he would be running, he would spend almost 60% of his professional time outside of the floor of the U.S. Senate fundraising. Dinners, cocktail parties, the, you name it. And it, for him, he just got to the point where he just... It, it, it was just so remarkably daunting to him and so, in his mind, inappropriate um, that he wouldn't do it, obviously, as a U.S. Senator. So for candidate Christie or a gubernatorial candidate, it's, it's, it's terrific to have a public match, to have that kind of level of uh, engagement where the candidate is actually out with the voters much more often instead of fundraising with just a small subset of people um, you know, all the time. And you see it on the presidential level now, both President uh, Obama and Governor Romney, you see spending much more time in non-target states this year than you've ever seen in the past because there is there is this ongoing yeah. race. You can't fall behind in the in the Columbus media market. You've got to have your 1,000-plus points in that media market, and you've got to do the same in Dayton, and you've got to do the same in Jacksonville, and you, know, you have to be there. And so it is this constant pull between do I have enough money on TV versus going out and actually shaking hands with people and getting kind of earned media coverage in, in a target state. Yeah. Next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my question is for uh, the Crossroads right wing uh, guys. Uh, wow, we don't know which perspective you're thinking of it from. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned the uh, the foundation of some of the right wing PACs uh, being specifically a response to a lot of union money on the left. Um, I'm curious if you'd still consider you guys uh, at, a, at a disadvantage, uh, all this you know, allegedly rampant uh, union money coming in from the left. Uh, would you say the, leving, the playing field has been leveled? Uh, now that a lot of the money has also trickled down to congressional races and also for the left, do you think uh, that we'll see in the future uh, any of the uh, lefty PACs uh, coming in and funding more congressional and Senate races? Um, do you think that we'll see some ads, specifically targeted ads, you know, attacking people like Todd Akin or Chris Smith for their radical views? Or do you think this is, uh, on the left side, specifically something that's uh, reserved for the presidential election? I would, I would leave Chris Smith and Todd Aiken in separate categories going forward, so. <laughs> Matter of opinion, yes. <laughs> well, that's Did you we, hear about that allegation? No. No. Sorry. We, we won't know what the unions will have spent until after they file their reporting whenever they file their LM2s. I do know from the Associated Press a few months ago uh, reported that the unions would spend somewhere in the neighborhood of $400 million in 2012. They spent... 400 to 450 million. I can't remember the number in 2008. So I, I would suspect that it's going to be up in that in that range. But in terms of what they actually spend uh, after all is said and done, I don't think we'll know that until the middle of next year. Koch okay. Brothers, 200. Adelson, 100, which is pretty cheap, by the way. You're letting that guy off cheap. Um, that's 300 <laughs> by two between people. three people, right? The Koch Brothers and and one other guy. So I I, I don't think it's going to be even. Um, I think it'll be very clear to be. To answer your second question, there is actually a lot of activity on the left in terms of super PACs in these Senate races, uh, in these House races. Um, there's a group called Majority PAC, Senate Majority PAC, and House Majority PAC. Um, and those two entities are actively funding 
um, uh, their own set of advertisements in all those places. Uh, in certainly in the Todd Aiken race, in the Missouri Senate race, I mean, that's you know, their problem that they have to deal with. But you know, Claire McCaskill was looking like it was going to be a very tough election, and Todd Aiken opened his mouth. So there's plenty of activity on the left side in that race and many other races. Mm -hmm. Look, there's also activity in the sort of center. I mean, one of the races that the two of us are, are against each other. I work for a guy in Indiana named Joe Donnelly. Indiana is supposed to be a Republican state, supposed to be no way that a Democrat can compete for the United States Senate. And a Tea Party guy, Richard Murdoch, came and beat um, the great Dick Luger, the great senator for so long, um, and beat him in a primary. And for the last two months, that race has been tied. Uh, Crossroads just came in with a huge buy, um, but the Democratic side has a lot of money in as well. The DSCC, the NRSC. If you look and you go to Indiana, and uh, I said Montana before, if you go to Montana, you cannot watch TV without seeing nonstop political advertising. And it's not the, can the candidates are the teeny piece of this um, now. So, so we, we, we have plenty of verve on our side, I promise you. Uh, hi, thanks everyone for coming. I want to ask this question for uh, Jonathan. Um, well, thanks for coming. And uh, I would like to, I believe, I think everyone here would agree that democracy in the few, if we have so much money in the few, so, so little people, do you think that that undermines democracy? Because me as a volunteer, I can volunteer a whole year, but when Sheldon Adelson gives one million dollars that makes more more than what all i can do for working for a campaign and how how is that how do you think that that disenfranchises what we are as america as a democracy because i expect that for america i just think you have to look at what the alternative is right i mean the alternative to saying that sheldon adelson can't advertise is effectively censoring sheldon adelson so I don't know that you want to be put into a situation where you have a government that's determining that somebody who wants to put his ideas up on television can't do that. And that's kind of one of the, that's one of the things with, with, with campaign finance is that it's, what, what do they say about democracy? It's the worst form of government except for all of the other forms right. of government out there. The campaign finance system may not look perfect, but when you start looking at what the alternatives are, I don't know that they're very good either. I don't know that it's a good idea to have the Department of Justice determining that uh, Sheldon Adelson can't run television ads wherever he wants to run television ads. I think you should be able to do that. I think that that's a First Amendment right. And I think that once you start moving into that constitutional right, I think that that's when, you, that's when it starts getting ugly. Yeah, yeah I mean, well, we, we don't think, I mean, look, even on, even on our side, it's not, look, there's been money in elections for forever, lots of money. Um, going back as long as long as we can, we can go back to George Washington, and there are stories about how George Washington, the night before, there was um, tales of buying rum and beer, and the voice of Grog rang out the day of election day. I mean, he's talking about sort of how they got out the vote. So there's been money and things in politics for as long as we know. So I don't think either side of us necessarily thinks that that the money itself. And that having money and, and doing uh, the, the way we need to do campaigns is necessarily evil. It's about disclosure. It's about how these things are funded. And so for me, for example, if Sheldon Adelson wants to put up an ad, oh, yes, the Supreme Court, free speech, okay, put up an ad, but at least stand behind it, right? That's the one thing. Tell us who you are. Tell us what you're saying. I think that's probably a different world than what we're living in today. And, you know, I'm, I'm in one of these super PACs, right? I'm dealing with it, living with it, but we're dealing with it because we're not going to disarm, as Mike said, right? We're not going to unilaterally disarm. Um, but there have to be better ways than this. Okay. Go next. Thank you very much for your question. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming. I have a second question. Both Democratic and Republican politicians have publicly spoken out against the existence of PACs and super PACs, saying that they hurt and corrupt our democratic system. What do you believe on this issue? issue uh, what do you believe I, I mean I I, I believe I believe that the Supreme Court erred and that the the outgrowth of all this is not necessarily great um, and I think that there has to be a, a better way um, I think that the first thing that the you've heard talk about I mentioned before is the disclose act uh, which has been bandied about certainly from the Democratic side with very with no Republican support um, in terms of having disclosure, uh, far more disclosure, so we would know what's going on. Um, uh, and I think we'd be better off. Uh, our democracy is strong, let's be clear. So, you know, we're, we're, we're okay. We're not 
we're not dying based on this, but, uh, but there's no question that we still have some tweaking to do. Don't forget what Maggie said, though. Every time we've thought that sort of in, in 2000, 2004, 2002, 2002 that it was final. like the IEs and it was all about, so the 527s were 2004, and then there was something else in 06, there's always a new iteration. So, I mean, that's the other thing. Don't, don't ignore that. There's something new will come around. I think it's great. I mean, I, I think most of us, on, we agree we got involved in the political process for a reason. I have, like, tremendous faith in the voters. I have tremendous faith in the voters in Montana who watch every single ad and can sift through it and yeah. figure it out. We have a great history in our country of doing that and being able to figure it out. And it is the job of both sides, both the candidates and, and folks on either side who want to advocate, to advocate hard. But I have great faith that the voters can, can figure it out and By see, the way, it's, see through it's, it. It's, it's, excuse me for one second. The, we're talking as... East Coasters here, though, but remember, when you go to the left coast, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars on ballot initiatives on yeah. top of it, yeah. which is like so much money spent on prop da 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 that is involving yeah. something that you may have no clue or care about. Um, and the, the airways are even more crowded. Thankfully, California has more airways to deal with. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, the ballot initiatives are another thing that, that are there and largely funded by individuals. Um, or large groups trying to get some point across on both sides. Hi, it's uh, great to have all you folks here. Um, unions in the United States are a dying thing, really. They're, they're something like 12% of the private workforce. Their last bastion really is the public sector. So with the loss of their membership, their influence is obviously going to wane. How long do you see the unions remaining a potent political force, and are they even still that strong nowadays when you have um, Scott Brown, no, sorry, Scott Walker, Scott Walker in uh, Wisconsin, able to defeat them a couple of times. In Ohio, they did take some hits. Um, I'm curious as to hear your view. Maggie, you want to take yeah. it? No, you could start. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I do, I, on the future, I can't really say. I do know, I could just go back to, to 2010, where three of the top five spending outside groups were unions. Uh, that was reported in the Wall Street Journal, and I think that there's, there's a whole slew of, of, of research to back that up. Uh, maybe not on television, but in other ways that unions spend money. So uh, at this point, they're still very strong. In terms of the future, of, I, I would turn it over to Maggie. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think this, look, like any other, any other sort of sector, if, if unions don't innovate, they're going to have a problem. Uh, and and that, I think that's the case for, for everything, for everybody, for a company. I mean, they have to think about new and unique ways of really getting at the heart of what, that they, of what they care about, right? Uh, and so uh, there is a whole history, right, whether it's civil rights or women's rights or workers' rights, where people actually remembered why unions were created in the first place. Most of the world today has no recollection of why that happened. They don't know that there was, you know, you had to work 18 hours, you never got overtime, you didn't get paid what you were supposed to get paid. You, you got paid a number that you couldn't even let you live in the town in which you worked. I mean, people don't understand where the sort of value base came from. And so there's going to have to be some kind of an evolution and innovation within that movement. I see unions today, the smarter ones, doing all kinds of interesting things. You know, doing corporate affairs works where they actually follow pension resources, where they take their own money and create economic development. You know, a lot of what I saw building trades unions do during the recessionary climate when banks weren't lending was taking their own pension contribution, their own investment managers, and seeking out economic development opportunities. That's smart, right? That's, that's looking at sort of how do I get economic development activity, get my folks work, certainly ensure my rate of return, but, but do something to incent the economy to move again. So I think there's a lot of really compelling unions out there that are really innovating and thinking differently about it. Um, but I think to underestimate uh, the kind of political prowess that unions have today in America, uh, you would, you, you'd, it, it wouldn't be smart. They're, they're a pretty powerful group. And I would say, I would just say one thing to watch as we go forward politically, especially in New Jersey and the Northeast, we come from a much more unionized state than, than a lot of states in the South that have right to work laws and, and, and have different things. So the unions have different power in different states. But I think one of the things that's important to watch, you saw it in Wisconsin, you see it in other places, is a growing schism between uh, public sector union workforce, which, as you say, is growing, and, and the trades and private sector. I think they're very, ultimately very different views on politics and very vis different views on public policy coming from those sides. And I think that's, uh, I think we're at an early stage on that, but I think it is something to watch as we go forward in terms of the different kind of political objectives of, of, of public sector and private sector, which ultimately I think have ultimately different objectives, and I think ultimately you will see a bit of a divergence uh, in that. People, this is a really popular topic. People love talking about this right now, this sort of division between public and private sector unions. The truth of the matter is there's a certain number of tenets within the labor movement, and if you believe in them, you're trade unionists. That's what you're called, whether you're public or private. Public and private sector unions have always had a different agenda, right? Public sector unions are focused on 
Uh, you know, how can you maintain a quality level of services and what do you pay for those services? Private sector unions have a different sort of obligation in order to go to work, right? If there isn't private sector activity in, in the economic or the economy in which you live, then you're not going to be able to put your private sector members to work. So there's always been a different agenda in terms of how they sort of focus on the main public policy questions. Behind that, though, there is a sort of very unanimous view on things like collective bargaining and a series of sort of tenets of the labor movement. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming here and talking to us. Um, my question is, you guys talked before about, you know, with the emergence of super PACs and how uh, the candidates um, kind of influence on what they say and, you know, how much of being what's said is of, of their influence uh, is kind of diminished. Um, and I was wondering, uh, if, A, you know, how much on, on the super PAC level uh, is it, you know, wait and see what the candidate does with their campaign or Good do question. you strike first with the issues and, uh, you know, B... In the future, do you see more of the super PACs setting the uh, issues in, the, in an election cycle, or do you kind of wait and see what the candidate does? Because you know a lot of the, uh, the issues that are talked about come from the media. So I was just wondering what the influence of that going forward is, you know, whether or not the super PACs set the issues or uh, the candidates themselves. That's a good question. That. Well, I, it, look, and, and the, the super PAC word, throw that out for a minute, because I think what you're really talking about is kind of these independent expenditures, right, the br all of them. And it really depends on the race. Um, what both sides are armed with lots of good pollsters, for example, who are looking at numbers. Like global China, strategies. For example. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to figure out whether what's happening in a race. And if we're in a race, for example, and we're doing well, uh, let's take Indiana, for example, a perfect, perfect example where Joe Donnelly didn't have a primary, comes out, strong position, the Republicans have a primary, and at the end of the primary, the Republican candidate is left with no money because he spent all his money attacking um, Dick Luger. Uh, and so we're up, all the polls show us ahead, um, we're doing great, and so they've got to sit there and say, okay, we know that Murdoch is sitting there with no money. Do we jump in and try to help? We know that he's going to raise money over the next four, six, eight weeks, and so should we fill that time? So. That's the kind of decisions that all of these independent expenditures go through all the time. Sometimes they are. Um, I think in general, we love to take hints from the candidates um, because even though we're not coordinated, which we're not, we do not coordinate our activities, it's always better the notion that we are taking hints to see sort of what the campaign would like um, because we don't really want to do something that they don't like because obviously they're the campaign, they know best what they're doing. Um, but uh, but no doubt, sometimes we do. Sometimes we're the ones who jump first. I think that that's a great answer. And traditionally, I mean, to, to be candid, right? Traditionally, it's it's contrasting negative, right? Traditionally, right, what you're going to see is, and I think I think that the Obama campaign was quite clear about this in terms of hints, right? Which was that they were not going to wait long to define Mitt, Mitt Romney from their perspective. They, in, in terms of their campaign, they felt if they didn't do a good job defining Mitt Romney from the outset, um, that with the economic climate and everything else that was going on. You know that this would be a much more difficult situation. What what you know what Jeff and his team have pulled off, right? As I think, really sort of ingrained in average voters' minds a certain perception of, of Mitt Romney, um, and I and I think that they did a, a really fine job at it. And I think it's part of what the Romney campaign is trying to reposition itself and figure out how to move forward on. The Obama campaign did a masterful job too, as uh, be before we got there, <laughs> with a lot more money. Um, I, I, an interesting thing, Jonathan. I wonder. What percentage do you think of the crossroad, the GPS ads, the, the, the federal, the non-presidential, do you think will be comparative? So have some element of positive to them, or, oh, or to date? That's a very, very good question. Um, that's, a, that, that's an excellent question. This is kind of tangential, but uh, because we can't, Sorry. because outside groups can't coordinate with campaigns, I think it's interesting for, for, for a class like this, because outside groups can't coordinate with uh, candidates and, and party committees, what it means is for television ads, it means that the candidate can't really star in our ads, right? Yeah. right? I mean, we could go to a Mitt Romney event and film some Mitt Romney footage, but we'd be getting the same thing that the news crews get. We can't shoot an ad of Mitt Romney talking to camera about why he should, you know, why he'll be the, why he'll be, he'll be the best president. Uh, so what it kind of does is these, these anti-coordination laws actually almost make all of the outside group advertising negative. negative. Because at that point, you know, you know that we're not coordinating with uh, Barack Obama to run a negative ad about him, right? But if we were to run a positive ad about Mitt Romney, uh, then people would start, you know, questioning where, where did you get the footage from? It's interesting, in 2010, uh, Crossroads ran an ad uh, supportive of uh, now Senator Rob Portman in the uh, in the Ohio Senate race, 
um, we had pulled the video footage from a you know publicly available uh, place, YouTube, so on and so forth. And immediately, within a couple of hours of the ad going on the air, the Ohio Democratic Party filed an FEC complaint against Crossroads alleging that we had coordinated with the campaign to get the footage. That was enough of a headache that we haven't run a positive ad since. <laughs> Nobody wants to have an ongoing you know, litigation within the FEC over something silly. Uh, perversely, the campaign laws have created a situation where there's a lot of contrast advertising because of the prohibitions against uh, right, coordinating. Right, the committees do. So the, like the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the NRCC, the Republican Congressional, their independent arms, they are doing a bunch of comparative ads because they don't, while they don't coordinate, the, each of the candidates is throwing their information on the party website. Right? So the Republicans, Democrats, same exact thing. So there's been more from their committees. And I actually think that there may be even more over the, over the closing weeks, particularly in these swing states where I think the voters are so overwhelmed yeah. with the negative of the presidential, that, that there may be a bit more of the contrast things because I think that even the independent groups are saying, you know what? They sort of need a boost. Like, you know, we need to say something nice about these people. If you can, I'm, we're going to take this question. It's going to be the last question. We just have a few minutes left, and we want to do some, give their, our speakers some uh, closing remarks. To piggyback off of what you guys just mentioned with the uh, non-coordination laws, um, I'm curious if you guys could further elaborate on the uh, complexities that go into uh, making these uh, ads, because I could see that there's a uh, very delicate balance between completely muting the candidate or maybe even saying something that's negative to the candidate. What is the criteria that you guys specifically use to uh, create these uh, ads? Are they a part of a campaign plan within the super PAC, or do you just look at the other, at the uh, president or Governor Romney and take it from there? Do you want to talk about mm -hmm. how you turn research into an ad? Sure. I mean, we, we, it, it is, it's a very research-based thing, the whole process. I mean, campaigns are very research-based. So both sides, we're, we have, we're armed with data, and we want to test various things and what are people persuaded by? Are they persuaded by this message or that message? Social Security, education, um, uh, health care. What are the messages that will move people? And then we develop ads um, be, that are based on some of those messages. Once we're in the throes of the campaign, of course, we have to be, we have to be able to call an audible. Right? You have to be able to say, okay, we were going to do this, but the other side is doing X, and so maybe we got to go there. And so in the beginning, the best laid plans are there, and then they inevitably go all over the place, um, which is what is awesome about our jobs. I mean, truthfully, I, I love everything about my job I love, right? What could be greater? I wake up every day, I do politics for a living, and I have a blast. Um, so I mean, don't we, we love what we do? We love all of us who who get into this. Love the the game. Love what we're doing. Love electing people we believe in. Um, and and what makes it nice is it's never the same. Yeah, I also wouldn't under, ever underestimate the amount of research that goes into any political ad by a professional organization. If it's a smaller group, you never know what they're actually advertising on. But for a big group like Crossroads, you, you saw the ad that we ran. There are literally three or four verifications behind every, mm -hmm. assert, every assertion that we make. So, because the goal, you never want to get an ad pulled from the television channel. You don't want the station saying, hey, this is false, we're going to pull this ad. It's terrible. Uh, Crossroads, I don't think we've had an ad pulled. Uh, and one of the reasons why we've never had an ad pulled is because we have a team of researchers who are literally making sure that every, every assertion that we make in an ad is bullet pointed with levels, different levels of verification to make sure that the ad is 100% is factual. I think in terms of how, how the, the kind of best outside groups work are people who used to run campaigns. Yeah. Or, or I mean, basically, if you're doing a good job running an outside group, you're trying to figure out, you know, if I was running the campaign, what would be really helpful to see yeah. on TV tomorrow? And um, so the, the kind of the, the most responsible, I think, and the most effective outside groups are generally run by people with significant campaign experience who understand that an outside group really could screw things up if they've run the wrong type of ad. And they really can be helpful if they run the right kind of ad. And, and I, th I think to, to just go on what Jonathan said, just so people understand, an outside group, if the ad is false, if the ad can be proven to be factually inaccurate, the TV stations can pull them off the air. So if you challenge it and, some, and it is deemed to be false, they can be pulled off the air. It is almost impossible to do that to a candidate. So candidates have the freedom to say almost whatever they want. But we're much more conscious on the independent expenditure side. Both, side, I mean, the campaigns are too. But we spend a lot of time on the back end, as, as Jonathan said, researching, making sure the facts are right, because we don't want those ads backed up. By the way, not only do we spend money, all of us, both sides, figuring out what the mess should be, but once they create that ad, 
depending on the time frame, we may even test the ads, focus groups, online, online testing. So there's lots of different ways that we're trying to figure out, do these things work or not? And, and both sides are, are armed with, with, with this vast, vast masses of information to try to get to those very small number of voters we're talking to. We only have a couple minutes left. I thought if you guys wanted to leave this audience with one last thought um, about sort of uh, the role that you think these super PACs are playing uh, in this particular presidential race. And, of course, uh, 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 there's going to be no surprise. We'd love for you to handicap the Congress and the presidential race. No, that's, a, that, that's great. Thank you guys so much. It's been a great event. I, I would just go back to what I was saying about the tension between an elected representative and his constituents. Uh, if American Crossroads runs an ad about Obamacare, we're not – influencing how the public thinks about Obamacare. We're educating viewers about the record of a candidate or an elected official and their positions on Obamacare. So it's very, very difficult for a group to actually impact you know, what people think about an issue or what people think about abortion or tax increases. Those are values that have developed over decades with, with, with voters. But what you can do is you can educate voters uh, especially in situations where the, where the candidate or elected official has done something that is sideways with what their constituents think. Uh, I think it provides more information to the political process. Uh, you have to think about always what the alternatives are, uh, because if you didn't have a process like this, you could have a situation where you have publicly funded, taxpayer funded ads, you could have people not liking that tax, taxes are funding, uh, negative ads, you could end up with all kinds of censorship. I think you, it's always critical to look at uh, the alternatives to the system before you start talking about how we need to change the system. Thank you. Obamacare, the most perverse he owns it. bastardization of a policy plan done by the right wing where we have all the groups that Jonathan's talking about, talking about a $716 trillion, trillion, billion, what did I say? I always forget what it is, billion dollar cut to Medicare, which isn't true. Um, and even if you wanted to say it was true, every Republican that he's supporting also supports the exact same thing because they are accounted for in the Ryan budget minus $200 million more, right? So $916 billion. These are the things that I think are problematic in terms of how the, 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 you know, the policy debate, and I, and I think that the, um, the super PACs only make it worse because you have individuals who have personal um, opinions that they are trying to sort of foist upon people, and I think we'd be better off with the candidates. We just would be. Like I said, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of a super PAC. I'm happy to defend Barack Obama because he's the best and next president of the United States. Um, uh, and, and that's phenomenal. Um, but do I wish that this uh, didn't have to be? Yeah, I do. Uh, and I think that experiencing in Connecticut, we have public financing campaigns. In New York City, we have public financing campaigns. And you know what? They work just fine. Yeah. Um, uh, and the voters, while they may say in the beginning they're not that happy with taxpayer-funded uh, campaigns, you know, things have gone pretty smoothly in, in a lot of these places that have public financing. And so I just think uh, the rhetoric doesn't match the reality at the end of the day. Um, so we'll, we'll see where it goes, but more likely I think we'll see changes to the laws and, um, and then the next incarnation of super, super, super PACs, super duper PACs. Well, we want to thank you very much for coming and let you know that uh, Mike and I are actually running a campaign that's really important to everybody in this room in New Jersey this year. So vote yes on ballot question one. Uh, that's to invest $750 million in higher education facilities, which we haven't done in New Jersey in almost a quarter of a century. So I had to do one last plug for a 501c4 for a good reason, right, which is to make our students world-class educated and keep as many businesses and jobs here as we can. So vote well, yes on question one, and thank you very much for tonight. <laughs>